The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein once said, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Having the right words to talk about things allows us to understand and think about them. This is true of games as well. Today we learn the words to understand shmups. Hi, this is Christian from Lazy Devs. Wow, this video took quite a long time, but I'm glad to be finally here. As a preparation for phase two of the shmup tutorial, I want to do a comprehensive glossary of like shmup vocabulary. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's go. We are going to start with terms to discuss the shmup genre and its various subgenres. In fact, let's start with the word shmup. Shmup is the short form of shoot them up or shoot em up. It's a type of a game where the player controls a character or a vehicle that is continuously scrolling through a level and must shoot at waves of enemies while dodging their bullets. It's, you know, it's this type of game. STG means the same and is a popular term in Asian communities. STG is short for shooting game or shooting type game, I'm not really sure. In the 80s, these were also called simply shooters. However, the arrival of first person shooters like Doom made it necessary to distinguish shmups as a special type of shooters. Which is why sometimes a more generic, all encompassing term you hear is just 2D shooters as opposed to 3D shooters. This also explains why for some shmup aficionados, shmups are shooters. Classic shmup. As mentioned in my previous video, there are two prominent styles of shmups. Classic or old school shmups, where shmups typically created in the second half of the 80s. They feature fast enemy bullets, big collision boxes, and focus on power-ups and sophisticated weapon systems. Things like Gradius, R-Type or Raiden. Bullet Hell. Also called Danmaku or Manic Shooter. This is a more modern style of shmups. They feature a lot more bullets, but the bullets are also slower and the hitboxes are more forgiving. Good examples are cave shooters like the Danpachi or Toho shooters. Euro Shmup. Besides those two styles, there is also the so-called Euro Shmup. This is a somewhat derogatory term to describe shmups made by Western developers for personal computers rather than arcades. Prominent examples are Raptor, Tyrion or Jets and Guns. Without going into detail, a common criticism of Euro Shmups is that they don't have that kind of tight, refined gameplay Asian arcade shooters are known for. Euro shmups are often brought up as a cautionary tale for things to avoid when making shmups, although recently there has been some attempts to rehabilitate this subgenre. If this is something you are curious about, for more details I suggest this awesome roundtable discussion by Electric Underground, links below. Dojin. Dojin is a white term, but in context of shmups, it's basically the Japanese version of the word indie. The famous convention Comiket is a popular place for Japanese indie creators to share and distribute all sorts of creative works, including games. Shmup games, for instance. A lot of popular shmups started as a doujin, like the popular Tohu series or the famous Crimson Clover. Caravan. Now this is actually something that I found very interesting. So this refers to a very special shmup type designed to be played exclusively in live competitions. It could be kind of considered as an early form of esports. They have been popularized by Hudson Soft, who used to host competitions for promotion purposes in the 80s. Caravan shmups are incredibly short, often two to five minutes, and focus heavily on scoring. Many commercial classic shmups feature caravan modes, a good example being Star Soldier. Cue them up. Not really a genre, more of a shmup aesthetic. As the name implies, it refers to shmups with an over-the-top cute cartoony setting. Good examples are Pop and Twinbee or Parodius. Despite the visual style, these shmups can be just as challenging as their grim dark siblings. Tate. 
This is a Japanese word and refers to a specific screen orientation popular with vertical shmups. Vertical shmups, in turn, are shmups where the ship is at the bottom of the screen and shoots vertically upwards with a level background and enemies moving downwards. In arcades, it was common for the screens to be installed vertically so the players could see further ahead. And that vertical portrait aspect ratio is what we call Tate. In modern times, it is somewhat inconvenient, especially as the widescreen 16x9 ratio has become so popular. Tate shmups often end up squeezed into a widescreen display with a lot of dead space on the sides. Some shmups will just fill the space with extra information. Some will also offer dedicated Tate display modes, which are designed for players who play with a screen rotated to portrait mode or using a device like the flip grip on the Nintendo Switch. Is the opposite of Tate, sometimes also called Hori for horizontal. This refers to a more normal landscape screen orientation. Yoko shmups are commonly horizontal. The player ships shoot sideways, typically to the right. Think of R-Type or the Cotton series. These work better for landscape displays most consoles and PCs have. But for some shmup enthusiasts, vertical shmups feel a bit more natural and are, broadly speaking, a little bit more desirable. It is a tough trade-off though. By the way, for simplicity's sake, for the rest of this video I'm gonna assume we are talking about a vertical shmup when discussing screen directions and so forth. Vertizontal. Now this is a bit of a weird word, it refers to a vertical shooter played in a landscape mode with a very wide play field. This gives players that sought after feel of a vertical shooter, but is designed for a more common display aspect ratio. A good example of what this looks like is Jamestown Plus. This seems like a reasonable compromise. However, vertical shooters can be a bit of a design challenge. Players need to cover a lot more ground as enemies can spawn at very distant locations and enemy bullets tend to come from the sides, which can be awkward to dodge. More on that later. Now let's talk briefly about the games that are shmup adjacent but aren't exactly shmups. Rail shooters. Games like Res or Panzer Dragoon certainly feel shmup-like with plenty of enemies, plenty of shooting in an auto-scrolling environment. However, they typically lack the bullet dodging elements so core to shmups and are considered a whole separate genre. Run and Gun. Games like Contra or Mega Man have a lot of shooting and bullet dodging, but a big part of this genre are the platformer controls. I'd say this makes them more like platformers with shooting rather than, you know, shmups. Twin Stick Shooters. Games like Geometry Wars or Super Stardust HD have a lot of shooting and a lot of enemies and often come in these like amazing arcade retro aesthetics. But the gameplay here tends to be about crowd control and kiting with players fighting in a confined area rather than auto-scrolling through a long level. Again, it's kind of its own thing. But of course the borders between genres are fluid and permeable and there are plenty of games that are difficult to fit in a specific category. For example, is Star Fox a shmup or a rail shooter? I don't know. But there is this conversation between Mark MSX and Shmup Junkie, which expands on this topic a bit further if you are interested. Again, links in the description. Okay, with genre definitions out of the way, let us now move on to terms that describe how we play shmups. And this is where it gets interesting, so let me slow things down a bit. For one, because we have younger listeners in the audience who weren't there in arcade age, but also because I think this is where the most potential for innovation lies. Credit. Shmups have been originally designed around play on coin-operated arcade machines. You would throw a coin into the slot and that would get you a form of in-game currency called credit. To start the game you would need to spend a credit. You could then play until you ran out of lives, at which point the machine would ask you if you want to continue. This would of course cost another credit, so if you fed another coin on the machine, you would get all your lives back and continue where you died. This is why many arcade games have this weird countdown timer at the game over screen. It's to pressure players to spend money to keep their progress. Game over. Credit feeding. 
You could potentially play through the entire game if you fed the machine enough coins. This is what we call credit feeding. And it was a straightforward way to see everything the game has to offer if you are curious and had deep pockets. If you want to know what this looks like, here's a great video of two blokes co-op credit feeding through a pretty spicy shmup pro gear. And the fun thing is that at the end they counted how many credits they've spent. It turned out to be 32 credits. You'd basically spend the price of a full retail game to credit feed through an arcade machine once. Yeah, this is one of the way those machines made money. One CC. But of course, credit feeding wouldn't get you the street cred. The real way to play shmups is to practice until you can pull off a so-called 1cc run, which stands for one credit clear. Also sometimes called all clear or one all. This is where you beat the entire game on just one credit, playing all the way through without running out of lives. And if you think credit feeding was an expensive way to enjoy those games, well, all the practice required to pull off a 1cc would take far more than that. This is the other way those machines would make money. Let me take a small aside here, because at this point I wanted to dispel a myth. I think many have this impression that shmups are insanely difficult and that finishing a 1cc is an unreasonable ask for an average player. This is not the case, I think. It depends on the game, of course, but generally finishing a shmup for a 1cc doesn't really have to be any more time consuming than any other game. From personal experience, I got a 1cc in GGLS 3 in less than 30 hours. I got a 1cc in Crimson Clover on novice mode in less than 15 hours. And I'm not an amazing shmup player. These times are comparable to many other games I played. But I do agree that shmups can feel more intimidating and it may be worthwhile for us game designers to consider what we can do about this. Loop. Okay, so some shmups don't actually end at the final boss. Some shmups will just loop back to the beginning and immediately start a second run while often increasing difficulty. This is what we call a loop and beating the game twice in a row on a single credit is called a 2-all and then a 3-all and so forth, depending on the number of loops. No miss. Beating the game without even losing a single life is what is called a no-miss run. This is a pretty hardcore achievement and typically only something a seriously dedicated player would go for. Stage select. So this refers to some kind of menu that allows players to jump straight into a specific level rather than having to always restart from the beginning. This can be used for practice, but it can also be a valid and legitimate way to play through an entire game, just playing one level at a time like it's Super Mario World. Zero Ranger and Jamestown Plus are good examples of that. By the way, in Jamestown, the regular arcade style play through all of the levels in one go, one CC mode is also called Gauntlet, and I thought that was a pretty fitting name. Arrange mode. Arrange refers to a special mode in a shooter where enemy placement is kind of different from the regular mode. Arrange modes often also change the game mechanics. Essentially, arrange mode is a remix or a new game plus. Arrange modes can be a fun way to add replayability for fans who are already familiar with a particular title. As such, they are popular additions to re releases or compilations. And with that, Finally, let's get down to business. Here are some terms we use to describe the gameplay of shmups. Hitbox. Okay, this might be straightforward, but a hitbox refers to an invisible area of a sprite that is being considered in collision detection. In older shmups, the hitbox of the player's ship was often just as big as the entire sprite. But in modern bullet hell shmups, the player's hitbox is often tiny, and the bullet hitboxes can be also more forgiving. This makes the game actually easier, and it allows bullet hell games to put more bullets on the screen at the same time. It also just kind of like looks badass. Player's ship can get close to their bullets and squeeze through impossible gaps. And yeah, that's kind of like the dirty secret of bullet hell games. They pull all sorts of tricks like this behind the scenes in order to make you look like a badass. 
If you go for the tiny hitbox, one thing to pay attention to is how to communicate to the player where the hitbox is exactly. Some games offer convenient hitbox indicators, but I really appreciate it when the sprite of the ship already incorporates the hitbox in its design. In Crimson Clover there is like a glowing cockpit of the ship and that's also the hitbox. Neat. Iframes. Iframes is an abbreviation of invincibility frame. On some occasions, shmups will make the player ship invincible for a short amount of time. This happens most prominently directly after getting hit to prevent the player from getting hit multiple times in a row. But shmups also give iframes when the players are dropping bombs or sometimes when they are picking up power-ups, which can be a great way to add strategic depth to all those actions. Bomb. A bomb is a common shmup game mechanic where players can trigger a screen clearing attack to get out of a difficult situation. Bombs will often do damage to all of the enemies on the screen, but also clear bullets or give iframes. Because they are so powerful, bombs will be typically limited in some way, for example by only having a limited stock of bombs. It is also worth noting that contrary to what many think, not all shmups have bombs and not all shmups need bombs. Alas, the GG3 has no bombs. Gradius and R-Type have no bombs. You can have a shmup with no bombs. It's fine. Hyper. A hyper system refers to a game mechanic where the player charges up some kind of hyper meter or a hyper gauge and then they can spend it to activate a hyper mode that grants them increased power, invulnerability or various other enhancements for a limited time. Hyper systems will sometimes replace bombs in modern bullet hell games, but not always. Crimson Clover is a good example of a hyper system and it features a hyper mode, but also regular bombs, all tied to the same hyper gauge. Power up. Again, you probably know this already, but these are these little floating objects that players can pick up to gain some kind of bonus. What power-ups do and when they spawn varies from game to game, but it's important to keep in mind that power-ups are fundamentally different from any other objects in the shmup. Most other objects are dangerous to players, so the players will try to avoid them. Power-ups, on the other hand, will attract players. This push and pull effect creates tension in a shmup. In fact, this is such a core concept and we will see this over and over again. So let's keep this in mind as we move on. Push and pull. Might have just as well called them push and pull and ups. Lives. Again, this is a concept known from many other games. It's a measure of how many times the player can die before they go game over. Please continue. Pretty obvious. What is not obvious is that in most shmups, getting hit once, no matter by what, will result in a loss of life. Health point systems do exist in some games, but are rare and often associated with Euro shmups. More often than not, it's all one shot deaths. Additionally, some older shmups would even reset the game to a previous checkpoint when losing a life, but nowadays it's more common to just seamlessly continue playing. Extend. When you get a life in a shmup, we call that an extent. There are different ways of getting an extent. Some shmups will give you an extent when you reach a certain threshold in your score. That's a scoring extent. Some shmups have hidden power-up extents called a stage extent. Extents offer a positive feedback loop where learning the game allows you to get further in your playthrough. Not just because your skill improved, but also additionally because the game gives you more resources. Resources. And resources is a wide term for all the things the player collects and spends throughout the game. Lives, bombs, weapons, hypermeter, whatnot. Managing your resources, choosing when and how to spend them is a key aspect of shmup strategies. Autobomb. Autobomb is a special accessibility feature of many modern shmup adaptations. If autobomb is turned on, the game will automatically trigger a bomb when a player is hit. Because bombs trigger iframes, this will basically prevent the loss of a life. It essentially turns bombs into lives. Popcorn. Shmups typically feature a wide variety of enemies, but the most basic common enemy type that you see over and over again is a fast, 
small, easy, low HP enemy that harasses the player in large swarms. We call this enemy type a Zako or a Popcorn and most shmups will have these. Ground enemies. Shmups will typically distinguish between air and ground enemies. In very old shmups like Xevious, there was a special attack to destroy the ground enemies, but it was cumbersome and shmups quickly defaulted to having the player shot hit all enemies, no matter if on the ground or in the air. The main difference is that the player can fly above ground enemies, but typically get hit when colliding with air enemies. Shot. We got that far without even talking about something as basic as a shot. The shot is a particular bullet pattern the player's ship is shooting. Many shmups will actually allow players to choose from different ship types at the beginning with the ships having different shots. The player's shot can also vary and evolve over the game. Spread one way to talk about the differences in the shots is to look at the spread. Generally, shots with less spread will do more damage to a single enemy at a distance, but might require more horizontal mobility when facing popcorn enemies. Shots with more spread will make it easier to hit popcorn enemies without having to move horizontally as much, but if you want to do more damage to one big enemy, you need to get close to make more of your bullets hit the same target, which of course is dangerous. So yeah, we have another push and pull effect happening here, which is why many shots in modern shmups will feature some amount of spread. Focus fire. Many modern shmups will give players two shot types to switch between, a wide spread for popcorn and a focus fire for big enemies. Typically switching to focus fire will also slow the player's ship down, so it's easier to weave between the tight bullet patterns. And yeah, that's that signature bullet hell game feel, baby. Options. Okay, now if you looked at a bunch of shmups, you maybe saw these little pods that hover around the player's ship. These pods are called options, and in older games, options were upgrades you would gain by collecting power-ups. Modern shmups will often just start you out fully decked out with options. There is lots of fun things you can do with options. In some games, options will trail the player, others will allow you to use the options to aim your shot in different directions. Options can be also a good opportunity to simply add cool animations to a player's ship. I love how in Doton Pachi the options circle above and below the player's ship to create a pretty double helix laser pattern. Mm -mm -mm. So cool. Inertia. Now here is a big one, so take notes. Most shmup players dislike inertia. Inertia is when a player's ship takes a few frames to speed up or slow down. This looks natural and can be used to great effect in, for example, in platformers. Super Mario has a lot of inertia and it lends the character a sense of weight. But shmup players hate inertia because it makes the ship movement imprecise and laggy. It becomes so much harder to navigate the tight bullet patterns, so most shmups actually will have no inertia. And coming from an animator's perspective, this feels counterintuitive. Overlapping action. And here is where options can help. No inertia can look a bit stiff and artificial. As I said, it's something that animators are generally trying to avoid. But having some options lag behind the player ship can make that kind of movement look more natural and juicy. Animators call this effect overlapping action. It's not a shmup turn, it's an animator's term, but I thought I should mention this here. Normalized diagonals. Speaking of movement, normalized diagonals is something you should consider. This basically means that if you move your ship diagonally, you don't just add vertical and horizontal speed, because this would result in a player's ship moving faster when it's going diagonally. And this causes all sorts of problems. It's a common issue in many games, and there are many ways to normalize diagonals. A quick fix is to just add the speeds like before, but then multiply the result by about 0.7. Shot limit. A shot limit is one of those things old games had because of hardware limitations, but it can kind of be nice to have even in modern shmups because it leads to interesting gameplay. So when a game has a shot limit, it means that only a certain number of the player's shot can be visible on the screen at any given time.
If the shots have been all fired, the ship stops firing until the shots disappear, either by hitting an enemy or leaving the screen. So here's an example. This is Contra on the Game Boy. Yeah, it's not a shmup, it's a run and gun. It's the same concept though. So it has a shot limit of 5. If I fire off to the right, the gun has this distinct stutter pattern. It looks like the gun is in some kind of burst mode, but no, it's just the result of the shot limit. Because you see that if I fire to the left, the gun is firing constantly. A shot limit can naturally incentivize players to get closer to the enemies, because that's how their gun can fire at a higher frequency and do more damage over time. Aura. But there are other ways to achieve the same effect without a shot limit. In Doranpachi, Focus Fire will also create an aura around the player's ship, which damages any contacting enemy. So Focus Firing at point blank does more damage. All of these are examples of achieving push and pull effects by different means. Lock on. Lock-on is another popular shot mechanic. In some shmups, you can hold the lock-on button to automatically lock on to multiple enemies in a certain area around you. When you release the button, all of the targeted enemies will get hit by homing shots. This is what it looks like in Crimson Clover. Players are additionally incentivized locking on to as many enemies as possible before releasing the shots, leading to some interesting push and pull adjacent decision making. So far, we've been talking about the player shots. Let's talk about enemy bullets. As you know, shmups feature incredibly complex bullet patterns, but surprisingly, all those patterns are really achieved with just two different bullet types. Static bullets. Or blind bullets are bullets that the enemy fires into a predefined direction. In Cherry Bomb, our green enemies were always firing straight down, no matter what. Aimed bullets are fired at the player's ship. In Cherry Bomb, the red enemies were always aiming at the player. And it's important to keep in mind that aimed bullets will still travel straight. They are just aimed at the player's ship at the time where they are being fired. And those two different types of bullets fulfill different purposes. Static bullets are used to control space. They make parts of the playfield inaccessible or dangerous to players. They can be used to confine players. Aimed bullets, on the other hand, require players to keep moving. So once again, we have that push and pull tension we talked about earlier. Okay, so here are some really subtle things, things that, you know, the average player might not even notice. Dead zone. So you know how enemies typically spawn at the top of the screen? Well, if the players get really good and memorize the spawning pattern, they can get way ahead of the enemies and destroy them before they even fully emerge onto the screen. To counter this, many shmups will introduce a dead zone at the top of the screen where enemies will receive no damage. This gives a chance for the enemies to actually spawn and prevents the game from becoming trivial. Ceasefire zone. The next one doesn't really have a good name. Some call it cutoff mark or inactive zone or, you know, ceasefire zone. It's essentially the opposite of the dead zone. The idea is that if an enemy moves below a certain threshold on the screen, they will stop firing. This prevents enemies from firing at the player from behind. In shmups, players typically expect the threats to be coming from one direction, from above in Tati shmups. Threats coming from below is generally seen as unfair. It can be done occasionally to spice things up, but even then it is usually accompanied by, you know, big flashing indicators. Random shots coming from behind is a no-no and should be avoided. Yeah, bro, no! And this is also why vertizontal shmups are kind of a design challenge. It's because threats start coming from the sides as well and that can be a bit awkward. Bullet ceiling. So one problem with ground enemies is that because players can fly above them, the ground enemies might be able to shoot at point blank without giving players the chance to react. And this could be frustrating. For this reason, some shmups introduce bullet ceiling. If the player gets close to a ground enemy, that enemy won't shoot anymore. They will be, so to speak, sealed. This won't be really communicated to the player, it's just something that happens in the background to make the game smoother. Obviously, this only applies to weaker ground enemies. Boss enemies won't get sealed. All right, moving on to something that's more well known. Bullet canceling. 
is a mechanic where killing an enemy will also delete all of the bullets that the enemy has already fired. How exactly to trigger the cancel and which bullets can be cancelled can vary from game to game, but this can be an effective trick to allow the game to increase the density of the bullet patterns. As long as players can get off a juicy cancel, gonna get a big juicy cancel here, Just gonna dodge through these bullets, Dude. yeah! They can survive pretty much any pattern the game is throwing at them. It also speeds up the frequency with which the game can throw new enemies at the players because there is no need to wait until a previous bullet pattern leaves the screen. Suicide bullets. Also called return bullets or revenge bullets. The idea here is that killing an enemy will spawn a small burst of aimed bullets. I've seen this technique mostly used as a way to make a more difficult game mode. Just take a normal game mode, slap revenge bullets on top and boom, difficult mode. TLB stands for True Last Boss and is a bit of a shmup staple. The idea here is that there is usually an additional boss fight at the end of the game if the player satisfies certain conditions. Big juicy cancel. Oh, by the way, it's not over yet. Yeah, We've got another form, because yep. this is Ultra Baby. For example, Crimson Clover usually ends after stage five, after the stage five boss. But if you had a 1cc run until then, you face the true last boss instead. TLBs can be a fun way to motivate players to hone their skills and go for the 1cc run or some other achievement. Time out. Speaking of bosses, most boss fights in shmups time out after some time. If you survive for long enough, the boss just leaves and the game moves on. This can be good for new players who may not have figured out how to do enough damage to a boss. This can be also good to prevent expert players from milking. We talk about that later. Grazing. This is a popular, relatively modern game mechanic. The game will reward staying close to a bullet when it passes the player, either through points or through some other means. Grazing can be another great push and pull effect. A popular current game with a prominent grazing system is Danmaku Unlimited 3, if you want to see how that looks like. Rank. This was actually pretty surprising to me, but many shmups, even the very, very basic ones, offer some kind of dynamic difficulty system called rank. If the player is playing well, they will increase their rank for that run and the game will become harder. So you get more enemies and more bullets. Making mistakes will decrease the rank, making the game easier. As with any dynamic difficulty system, rank allows shmup games to be more forgiving to beginners and more challenging to experts. But in some games, expert strategies can even include consciously modifying the rank. You intentionally die at some stage to get a more favorable enemy spawn at some crucial point. One thing that is a bit odd is that rank is actually rarely communicated to players. Most of the time, it's something that operates invisibly in the background. Yeah, it's another one of those things. Slow down. It's not really a mechanic, rather, I don't know, like a phenomenon. In many old shmups, having too many sprites on the screen will slow the game down. It can be an aesthetic effect. Often, big boss explosions will be accompanied by slowdown, making it feel more epic. Kind of like a slow mo in action movies. But sometimes slowdown can also happen during the game and have gameplay consequences. GGLS3 has a lot of slowdown because it is a game that pretends to be run on an underpowered Sega Game Gear. But you can also play it on a setting that removes the slowdown and it is basically a whole different difficulty mode with a separate scoring board. Gimmick. Wrapping up. Generally, any special, experimental, weird game mechanic where a shmup is painting outside of the lines is called a gimmick. One could say that the polarity system in Ikaruga, for example, is a gimmick. A gimmick can be a great way to make a shmup stand out, but many traditionalist shmup players will look down on games that rely too much on their gimmick. As always, there is a balance to strike here. Okay, let's discuss some terms that players use to describe common game dynamics and strategies. Gradius syndrome. Also sometimes called power loss is a common problem that plagues 
old school shmups. In many games where you gradually upgrade and level up your ship over time, you will also lose your upgrades when you lose a life. This will often leave you in an underpowered state, especially late in the game, which will often lead to immediately losing more lives and possibly even going game over. With a Gradius Syndrome, it can often feel like lives don't really matter because getting hit only once is so punishing, it makes the game near impossible to win. Therefore, more modern shmups will tend to reduce the power loss or move away from upgrade-based systems altogether. What? What? Safe spots. Safe spots are strategies against certain attacks or bullet patterns. There are locations on the screen where a player can remain stationary and avoid getting hit. He moves quickly to a certain right, area because yeah. he knows that he this needs is to be a safe spot. Place. This is perfectly fine. Don't worry. Safe spots is something you generally get where patterns rely a lot on static bullets. Discovering and remembering safe spots is something that players will do over time as they develop a strategy on how to beat a game. But a game with too many safe spots can feel underwhelming because the safe spot kind of trivializes its corresponding attack. Bullet hurting means moving around the screen in a way that directs bullets away into favorable directions. For example, sometimes you might quickly dart to the top of the screen so a boss shoots a dense pattern upwards and leaves the rest of the screen empty. Bullet herding can be an effective strategy against attacks that rely a lot on aimed bullets. Tap dodging refers to quickly tapping left or right to move the ship slowly. This can be an effective strategy when facing a long sequence of aimed shots. Against this type of shot, it is often not required to move much for the shot to miss, so tap dodging out of the way keeps the bullets bundled up just beside the player's ship rather than spread around the screen. Micro and macro dodging refers to different strategies when dealing with bullet patterns. Micro dodging means weaving your way between the bullets in a pattern. Macro dodging refers to going the long way around a pattern to avoid it altogether. Rapid decision making whether to micro or macro an attack is part of that signature shmup gameplay. Point blanking or sometimes called speed kill, refers to something we already discussed, choosing to shoot at a boss enemy at close range in order to defeat them faster. Expert players know when it's safe to point blank an enemy and have strategies to avoid potential attacks at close distance. Finally, let us briefly touch up on some terminology around scoring. Survival. Generally, we distinguish between playing shmups for survival and playing them for score. Survival meaning playing the game just to make it as far as possible, with 1cc being the final goal. Players who have mastered the 1cc can then continue improving their runs to achieve higher and higher scores. They would be playing for score. But mechanics like score extents can make scoring beneficial for survival as well and can blur the line between the two approaches. The scoring systems can vary widely between the shmups, but there are some recurring concepts I wanted to talk about. Chaining Typically refers to killing enemies in rapid succession. Killing an enemy will trigger kind of like a short countdown, and if the player kills another enemy in that time, the chain number goes up and the countdown starts again. The higher the chain, the more points the player receives for shooting the enemies. Maintaining a long chain can be the key to a high score. Dodonpachi is a good example of a chaining system, but not all shmups have one. Medals are some form of pickup that only gives players points. Older games had these occasionally, but many modern bullet hell shmups shower the player in medals, resulting in a pretty intense pachinko aesthetic. Metal chaining is applying the chaining mechanics to the collection of medals. To maintain the chain, players need to collect the medals quickly in a row, or they are not allowed to miss any. As the chain grows, the medals become more valuable. Recently, Actane used the scoring mechanic in his PQH map, Cross Gunner. Milking is a strategy where players will intentionally prolong a boss fight in order to score more points. Milking can be extremely effective, but it's also considered a boring way to achieve a high score. It is good practice to prevent milking by adding mechanics like boss timeouts. Counterstop 
is a unique achievement when a player scores so many points, it is no longer trackable by the game's code. The game literally stops counting the points and the score remains frozen at its maximum value. In Pico 8, the highest possible number that can be stored in the variable is 32,767, so a counter stop might be highly likely. This is gonna be a bit of a challenge for us moving on when developing a shmup in Pico 8, we will have to develop strategies to raise the ceiling at which the counter stop would occur. Pooh, that was a long one, but you know, we started this video with this idea, you know, having the right words to talk about things allows us to understand them better and think about them better. And you might have noticed that actually some of the terms we discussed today here shed some light on pretty interesting game design questions. If shmups are supposed to be, you don't know, these hard games, why do they go out of their way to have, you know, like these ceasefire zones or bullet ceiling? And how can we make shmups less intimidating so that people are more encouraged to pursue 1CC runs? Hopefully these insights are things we can leverage in the upcoming phase two of the shmup tutorial. For now, let me know if there's any terms, any technical shmup terms that I didn't cover. I'm pretty sure I missed some of them. Let me know in the comment section. I also want to give big shout outs to two people who helped me with this video, Actane and Barkhog. Actane helped me compiling this list, but also provided a lot of the footage and feedback. He is basically a co-author of this video at this point, and you should check out his channel for amazing shmup videos. Thank you so much, Actane. I couldn't have made it without you, literally. Barkhog didn't participate actively, but his Bullet Hell Shmup 101 article was a tremendous resource I based a lot of this information on. It is an incredible document and we will go over it eventually, but you might want to look at it straight away if you want to know more. Or you can check out Barkhog's recent video series, which is a great follow-up to this video. Thank you so much, Barkhog. And as always, I wanted to extend a big thank you to all of my supporters on Coffee. Yes, this video has been made possible through the generous support of my subscribers on Coffee. A warm welcome to the new supporters including Bear Mask, JDJC3D, Slacks, Way, Polyman Def, Boris JT, Sir Rasputin, Paul Sanders, and Unmanaged Calamity. And also, as always, big shout outs to the growing regular Donut Plus crew, including Meats, Yasser Al Hamadi, Iron Taco, Jer, Chaz, Creeper Speak, Lennart Steinke, Heinz Stampfli, Brandon Black, Will Brown, Tom Hall, Sean Mangat, Ted Carter, BB Samurai, Andrew Edstrom, Pico 8 Fan, Shattered Polygon, Ben Smith, YLL, Likely Culprit, Senor Baub, Kixel Studio, Haiku Noodle, Tarek, Scott Goldsmith, Dr. Zamako, Scouch, Soup, Caesar Townsend, Captain Bly, Dracula, Caleb Blanken. Baker, KCA Childers, Andrea D'Amicio, Nexalam, Code Logic, Chemix, Pixel Jochen, ADG, Brian Baldwin, Scotty, GBG, Brian Davies, Andrew, Shaya, The Gacko, Jan, Angelo Dante, Maciek, Los Deku, Bellorek, Pendle Tong, Groove MD, Lackmare, The Coxworth, Cheap Shot, One Eyed Rabbit, Mario Carballo, Kevin Thompson, Pavel Shemchukovsky, Bretsky, Emperor Snow, and Nork. And if you haven't already, you can also support this channel on Coffee. One of the major perks is that you'll gain access to bonus content. For this video, I recorded a session where I talk about innovation areas for shmups, just sharing some new ideas. And also, you will gain access to phase two episodes earlier once they start coming out. So check out coffee.com slash lazy devs. Yes, 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 yes. This was the final, I swear, the final preparation video. The next video I will release on this channel will be the first video of phase two of the tutorial, Pinky Promise. I hope you are looking forward to this as much as I do. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.